All right, let's jump right in. Today, we're basically going on a mission inside a bacterial cell. Our target? Unpacking the entire process of prokaryotic transcription. We're gonna decode how that DNA blueprint gets turned into RNA. And you know, this is one of those core concepts you absolutely have to nail, especially if you've got your eye on an exam like the CSIR net. So here's how we're gonna tackle this. First, we'll get a full mission briefing. Then we'll move on to finding our target, which is all about initiation. After that, we'll see how the mission is executed during elogation, and finally, how it all wraps up with termination. At the very end, we'll do a quick debrief to make sure all the key intel sticks. Okay, first up, our mission briefing. You know, before we dive deep into the prokaryotic world, we first have to understand the lay of the land. And that means knowing how it's different from the system in eukaryotes. Getting this context right from the start makes everything else so much clearer. Just look at how incredibly streamlined the prokaryotic system is. There's no nucleus, so everything is just kind of mixed together in this cytosol. This allows for this amazing shortcut. Transcription and translation are coupled. What that means is, as the RNA is literally being printed off the DNA, ribosomes are already latching on and starting to make protein. It all happens at once. In eukaryotes, it's a completely different story. It's this long, drawn-out process. First, you transcribe in the nucleus, then you do all this fancy mRNA processing, splicing, adding a cap, a tail, and only then do you ship it out to be translated. It's way more complex. Okay, keeping that incredible efficiency in mind, let's zoom in on what is arguably the most critical part of this whole mission, initiation. This is the main control point. This is where the cell makes the big decision. Do we commit resources and go, or do we stand down? Everything hinges on getting this phase right. So what's the signal to start? It's something called the promoter. The best way to think about it is like a set of GPS coordinates on the DNA molecule. It's a very specific sequence, and it's located upstream of the gene. That is, just before it. It's basically a big flashing sign that tells RNA polymerase, land here, the mission starts right here. And these coordinates are super specific. These two sequences are absolute high-yield facts for any exam, so you'll want to remember them. A consensus sequence, by the way, is just the most common ideal version of that signal. So at the negative 35 region, you have the initial handshake site, but the real action starts at the negative 10 region, also called the PribNow box. See how it's full of A's and T's? AT pairs are held together by only two hydrogen bonds, unlike GC pairs, which have three. That makes this spot much easier to pull apart, which is perfect for starting to unwind the DNA. Now here's the catch. The main workhorse, the core RNA polymerase enzyme, is powerful, but it's also kind of blind. It can't find the promoter by itself. It needs a guide, and that guide is the sigma factor. When sigma joins the core, they form the hollow enzyme, and this is the complete mission-ready machine. The hollow enzyme scans the DNA, recognizes that promoter, and locks on tight. That's called the closed complex. Then it unwinds the DNA at the negative 10 region to create the open complex. Once the first few bits of RNA are made, the sigma factor's job is done, and it just pops off, letting the core enzyme get to work. And this idea right here is so important. The cell puts a massive amount of control into this very first stage. Why? Well, because transcription takes a ton of energy. The cell can't afford to waste precious resources making RNA from genes it doesn't need. So by tightly, tightly regulating initiation, it makes sure that the factory only starts running when it's absolutely necessary. So before the polymerase really gets going, it does this funny little stutter step. It's called abortive initiation. It'll make a tiny little piece of RNA, maybe less than 10 nucleotides long, and then just release it. And it might do this several times. It's not a mistake. Think of it like a final quality control check. This process is thought to help build up the tension and energy the polymerase needs to finally break free from its super tight grip on the promoter and launch into the next phase. Okay, the engine has started, the polymerase has cleared the promoter, and the mission is officially a go. Now we enter the elongation phase. This is where the real high-speed construction of the RNA molecule happens. Now you have to pay close attention to the directions here because it's a classic exam question. The new RNA chain is always built in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, always. To do that, the polymerase has to read the template DNA strand in the opposite direction from 3' prime to 5'. Prime. And what's cool about this is that the new RNA ends up being an almost perfect copy of the other DNA strand, the one that wasn't read, the coding strand. 
The only difference is it has a U where the DNA had a T. And the whole thing is powered by the energy released from breaking off two phosphate groups from each new nucleotide that comes in. So how does the polymerase stay so accurate? Well, it has this incredible built-in feature called the protein bridge. This little piece of the enzyme actually forces a sharp bend in the DNA template. This bend ensures that only one single DNA base is exposed in the active site at any given time. It's like a little gatekeeper, making sure the right RNA nucleotide pairs up before it gets locked into the growing chain. It's a brilliant and simple way to boost accuracy. But what if a mistake does slip through? Well, RNA polymerase isn't as good at proofreading as its DNA counterparts, but it's not helpless. If it accidentally adds the wrong base, it can actually sense the mistake, pause, slide backwards one step, and use a built-in cutting function to snip out the wrong nucleotide. Now, it's not perfect. Its fidelity is much lower than DNA polymerase, so some errors do make it into the final RNA, but it does have a way to fix its most glaring mistakes. All right, every good mission needs a clear ending. The polymerase can't just go on making RNA forever. There have to be signals encoded in the DNA that basically say, okay, you're done, stop here. And in prokaryotes, there are two main ways this happens. The first mechanism is called intrinsic termination. It's called intrinsic because the stop signal is built right into the RNA sequence itself. No extra proteins needed. As the RNA is made, a GC-rich section folds back on itself, creating this super stable hairpin loop. This structure acts like a physical break, stalling the polymerase. Right after the hairpin, there's a string of weak AU base pairs connecting the RNA to the DNA. So you have the stall from the hairpin, plus this really flimsy connection, and the whole thing just falls apart, releasing the RNA. The second method is row-dependent. This one requires help from a protein called Rho. Rho is a helicase. Its job is to unwind things. It binds to a specific spot on the new RNA called the rut site. And using ATP for fuel, it literally races along the RNA, catches up to the stalled polymerase, and then actively unwinds the RNA from the DNA, forcing it to let go. Mission accomplished. Let's do a final rapid fire debrief. These are the absolute must know concepts, the key intelligence you need to have locked down, especially for your exams. Okay, let's nail this down. Remember, the template strand is red. The coding strand is what the RNA looks like. The hollow enzyme is the complete machine, core plus sigma. The promoter has those key signals at negative 10 and negative 35. The complex starts closed, then opens when the DNA melts. Abortive initiation is that stutter start. Synthesis is always five prime to three prime. And termination is either intrinsic with the hairpin or it's dependent on that row protein. This slide right here, this is your study checklist. And I'll leave you with one final question to think about. We know the sigma factor is absolutely essential for finding the starting line, but for the race to actually begin, for elongation to happen, it has to be released. So why is that? What does releasing the sigma factor tell us about the massive change that RNA polymerase has to go through, transforming from a stationary machine that's locked onto a promoter to a high-speed engine that can just cruise down the DNA? Mull that over. Thanks for joining this explainer.